Welcome to the Corporate Counsel Business Journal's daily podcast, In-House Warrior, with host Richard Levick, Chairman of Levick, a global crisis and litigation communications firm. Good day and welcome to In-House Warrior, the daily podcast of the Corporate Counsel Business Journal. I'm Richard Levick, and if Louis Leo of Foley & Lardner is joining me today, it must be time for Garage to Global. Louis, great to see you. How are you? Uh, happy Monday, Richard. It is a great day when you know, I get to sit with you. You know, Louis, if if that's the level of enthusiasm that you've been able to muster for seeing me, uh, it must be a great Monday. So thanks so much for that. And uh, <laughs> Louis, I want to thank you for bringing, uh, inviting our guests today. Uh, we have uh, with us today Rob Bartlett, who's senior senior managing director over at Guggenheim Securities. Robert, you have a fascinating uh, resume, a career. So good to have you. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Richard. Thanks for having me. And would you be kind enough to sort of give your background? Because like uh, Louie and myself, you started out as a practicing lawyer and then found a better path. <laughs> I found another path. I found, everybody has to find their own way. Appreciate it. Sure. Happy to happy to walk it through. It's actually it was something for a long time I had to describe uh, to, to, to employers what, what, what path I took. So I um, uh, grew up uh, kind of all over the place. Um, I lived in uh, 40, 40 living situations by the time I graduated high school. So a little, little, little bit of a gypsy, uh, gypsy family, if you will. Um, so didn't have a lot of traditional mentors, but was very uh, attracted to uh, markets and capital and and capitalism. So I, I joke uh, and say I was the Alex P. Keaton, if anyone remembers that that uh, that show, Family Ties. So the the, the more more uh, more traditional route was interesting to me. So the first thing I came across was accounting. So I became an accountant at Deloitte, uh, did tax and audit work there, uh, and then worked with lawyers who I thought were amazing. Uh, and they deal with these huge issues, uh, much broader aperture than the narrow accounting stuff. I was doing a lot of 280G work and whatnot. Uh, for the uh, shout out for the for, for the tax people for golden parachutes uh, that, that that do that work, uh, and then uh, so so I continued to work full time at at uh, and 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 went to law school. Uh, so I was working at Deloitte, and went to law school full time at UC Hastings uh, out here in San Francisco, uh, and was able to cross paths with Louis at Simpson Thatcher, so uh, corporate uh, M and A law there. And then got to work with a bunch of bankers and, and got some envy and, and uh, actually started out Robert W. Baird in the mid market and then went on to BAML and then Goldman Sachs, uh, where I made managing director. Um, so at that point, you know, I had, had thought I'd found a, a home for life at Goldman, but I always had this itch. You know, I'd done this very traditional path, but then also had this very a traditional way of being brought up, which probably made me, uh, you know, let, you know less risk adverse or, or, or more entrepreneurial. So this, this opportunity at Guggenheim to found their West Coast office came up, um, which kind of combined everything I love with the, the technical aspects of banking and, 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 uh, and law and accounting with the entrepreneurial aspect of starting a new, new office. So that came together uh, beautifully with a, with a fantastic culture uh, that Alan Schwartz um, uh, and Mark Van Lith have built here uh, and, and given the opportunity to come start this office. So it was an exciting uh, next chapter here. So it's been for just under a year now. Rob, I'm going to turn it over to Louie in just a minute, but I'm going to take a risk here. You mentioned 40 living situations as a child, yeah. which is an extraordinary number. Uh, yeah. And to the extent that you're comfortable, can you share a little bit of that background? And I know you, you, know, you gave an introduction to how it influenced your thinking and a desire for structure. But if you could a little bit more and how it's influenced you over the years. Sure, absolutely. Um, so it was me and my, my I single mom uh, that I was raised with, and we didn't really even rent places. We were kind of always, cra it was like perma, perma couch surfing. Uh, so I, I have an allergy to that in my, in my adulthood. Um, so you were staying with someone for three months until that situation kind of blew up and then it was on to the next one. So we usually moved three or four times a year. It was kind of three month increments, plus or minus. Uh, and it was all over uh, Florida, all over, you know, different cities within Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Massachusetts, Arizona, New Mexico, California. So it was wherever the wind blew. We had like an old camper van, uh, the green machine from the, from we were living in the sixties life in the, uh, in the eighties and nineties. Um, 
so that was it. And it was, it was lots of schools and lots of situations. Jim Harbaugh, I know you're a big blue guy. Uh, he, he, one of his, my fa I identified with certain things. And one of them was his father was always moving around. And one of his lines was his dad said, sorry, kids, we're moving again. And Jim said, he said to his father, that's okay, dad. I just ran out of my last friends. So it was, you know, that kind of mentality a little bit. And I think you do develop that. So I have a strange thing where when people say, where is home? I actually don't have a place I associate with home because we just moved around so much and not even a, not even a geographic really um, you could say Florida probably I spent the most time but even in Florida it's it's not one specific city um, so it's uh, it's it's a little different uh, so I don't know what that is versus versus normal people um, I know for me it made me you know I have four kids uh, with my wife and and all born in the same hospital and you know I, I jog uh, on on good mornings uh, literally by the hospital where they're born so I probably over they've all gone to the same school you know very, I've over indexed um, and so I think it's probably maybe uh, more conservative than most personally um, but it also has given me an appreciation I think because we didn't have a lot of the traditional stuff so you know, forget about owning a home we rarely rented one. So just each of those milestones has really given me more meaning, I think, probably, uh, as I look at my counterparts who, who probably were more fortunate financially growing up, but they haven't been able to enjoy the milestones. The other thing I'd say pers on a personal note is um, I've noticed that people that have come from uh, backgrounds, that they really have to weigh in like a whole community into their decision making process. So they call their mom and their dad and their uncle who's in business. And there's like they have to build a consensus before they make a significant life decision. There's none of that. I mean, I, I've been playing with house money for many, many years. So I, I make the decision. I mean, I talk to my wife about it and, you know, and we decide and that's it. There's not there's not a, a whole consensus building that needs to go on. So just watching that personally, I think I'm actually kind of lucky in that I sort of uh, you know do what I do. And I don't have a lot of people to answer to other than my immediate family. My mother has no idea what I do other than vaguely I work for the man. I mean, that's that's been since I was an accountant. So she has no no idea. It's just degrees of working for the man. Um, so I, she recently referred to an MBA that I don't have, um, so she, has, <laughs> I, she has no idea what I do, um, which is fine, but well, we're going to come to that MBA and what you do with it. But <laughs> Robert, I thought, uh, a nice segue would be, what was it that brought you to San Francisco, uh, from all of those places that, that, that you, you lived in, uh, across the country? It's, I'll, I'll give you the honest answer, which I'm not sure I should give on a podcast. Uh, it, it's, it's not as it's not a thoughtful plan. Most people come here for the business or the whatever. Uh, I was a huge San Francisco 49ers fan as a kid. Ouch, um, ouch. And, and we lost yesterday, lost yesterday in the fourth quarter. And I was I, thinking uh, of you, Rob. I, uh, it was, it was painful, uh, but I, we, we were playing, we were playing with house money this year. So I was, I was, I was, uh, you know, I, I, better than I normally am. So that was the one thing I could bank bank on wherever the hecticness of my life led me was I could always be a 49ers, uh, you know, fan and they usually beat the local team, whatever team that was. Uh, and I, again, I didn't have anyone to really answer to as I was making a plan post high school. And I said, I want to go to where the 49ers are. Um, so that was, that was the extent of the plan. It's a totally, ins and I wound up marrying a girl. Brilliant from plan. Yeah, definitely not, but it wound up working out, uh, in spite of it, but that was, that was the extent of it. I love it. So Rob, uh, very, very rarely in life do we come across somebody who has reached the upper echelons of success um, as an auditor, then as a lawyer, and now really a, as, as an investment banker, um, whispering to, to CEOs about, you know, what to do with their, their balance sheets and uh, what, how, how they should look at the opportunities for growth. And um, I remember meeting you uh, as a young lawyer fresh out of law school. And what struck me about you was um, the absolute intensity that you brought uh, to the job, um, the, um, the hunger that, that you had to succeed. And uh, as a kid from Oakland, uh, you know, being the imposter in a, in a white shoe Wall Street law firm, I, I, uh, I totally identified with it. And um, I have admired it for many years and you know have the privilege of working with you from time to time in our in our current lives um and so you know i i thought it was it, it, one of the many moves that you made that i thought was exceptional was you had just made partner or pardon me at managing director at, at goldman sachs mm -hmm. and then bam you're out of there to start guggenheim tell, tell me about that um what a gutsy decision and by the way, one year in um, looks like a very smart one. 
uh, given the success you've had at Guggenheim. But but tell me, what what was the driver there? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks. And Louis, I, I always from the beginning felt felt, felt uh, a connection with you and, and admired uh, how you treated people, how you worked, how you approached it. That you you know you you live by example, you work by example, and set set that out with uh, with uh, how you manage folks. And I it was a tremendous amount of respect. So appreciate the kind words. Um, yeah, so Guggenheim was an interesting one. Uh, most people coming from Goldman become CFOs, uh, usually. Uh, after I quit, my boss actually became CFO of Instacart, and, 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 and his boss also made a similar move. Um, so that, that's a pretty normal path. Um, I, uh, I, I actually had always made the move financially was always a big factor for me, frankly. Um, and I got an offer at, from a, to become CFO of a, of a, of a public company. Um, and I was doing the work and I, I've developed a kind of a group of mentors that I use to, to chat with on big life decisions because I don't have the kind of normal connections. And one of them pointed out that I don't have to make this decision entirely financially. I should really do what I really want to do, which is really kind of hit me. I, I never really thought of it that way. I was always kind of you know next rung. Um, and what I wanted to do was be a banker. I, I really enjoy it. And, and I enjoy I enjoy the advocacy. I enjoy uh, coming up with great solution, creative solutions for, for our clients and, um, and getting them, willing them across the finish line and being a partner. Um, but uh, I also wanted to have kind of more of a, an entrepreneurial role uh, where I could uh, bring and build a team. You know, Goldman's pretty well built and pretty well established. So I don't, that skill set's not as needed there. Um, and, uh, so, I, but I had a pretty long list of criteria. So I wanted to be able to work on really large transformative transactions still uh, and leverage that I wanted a super collaborative culture. Um, and I wanted a place, um, so I could work on all the biggest stuff, uh, and, 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 and have an entrepreneurial, uh, uh, ability to really build something, uh, kind of against all odds, um, you know, in the Valley against, against, against the Goldman Sachs and the, and the Morgan Stanley's and the Catalyst. Um, and then had a really great collaborative culture because I've, I've worked at Fortune, you know, 100 best places to work, and I've worked at Fortune 100 worst places to work, and uh, all shall remain nameless. But it makes a really big difference in the day to day. So as, as I ran it all through all the screens, really only Guggenheim fit that criteria. Um, and so if it hadn't if it hadn't worked out here, I'd, I'd probably be a CFO somewhere. Um, uh, or still at Goldman, uh, but I, I wouldn't have gone to another bank. So th this one just was was a rare kind of perfect uh, Venn diagram of everything I was looking for. Um, and, and so you started the local office here in, in, in the Silicon Valley of a, of a East Coast uh, Midwest uh, investment bank with a, with a, a very white shoe name. Um, what was it like to hire in the middle of the great resignation? And tell me about you know, the ramp up of team. Yeah, re really challenging. So it, this is the hardest market to hire that I've been a part of, um, which is great from a from a labor perspective. Folks have lots of options. Um, also, I think w we got a little bit of a uh, historic advantage in the Bay Area because it's so beautiful with so much to do. And in a pandemic where everyone's working from home, that that doesn't bring much much leverage. So I think that was super challenging. So the 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 the, the kind of key positions around me, I could all hire from my past life, from not Goldman, but I've. I've had enough stops professionally that I was able to bring um, super high uh, caliber folks from other stops. So that was that was helpful that they'd all work with me. And then um, and then it, it, it was actually you mentioned the grit kind of factor. That's my number one factor for hiring because um, I found it's really it's hard to predict uh, success. But if someone has a lot of grit, a lot of desire, a lot of intensity, gosh, that, that, that usually translates. Um, th they'll kind of figure it out. So, so, so kind of trying to screen for that where you can't meet people in person as best you can. And the idea that we said is if it takes us a lot longer to hire, that's okay. Um, we just can't compromise on our, on our standards for a while. Um, and it's been a process. Um, it's been a bear, but we're now just crossing 10 people, uh, all focused in, in, uh, security and infra, uh, are the two main verticals that, that we've been focused on, but we're going to organically, uh, branch out, uh, more into application software, data analytics, other, other spaces. Um, but we, we've, we've, we've tried to hold it because I think that culture is just kind of everything. If the culture works and, and everyone's rowing in the same direction, I remember at Simpson back in the day, one of the most impressive things was, um, everyone's paid the same, it's lockstep. And you'd have juniors who, who got off early because they just didn't have a lot of work going and talking to juniors who had to work late that night and taking work off their plate to make it fair. And even if it was, you know, going through diligence or whatever, and I was so impressed with that culturally, uh, that, that, that they were so bonded together like that. 
Um, and I've always wanted to strove to try to replicate that kind of feeling that we're all in this together. Um, and, and it's, it's just, it's really hard to do. And I, I mean, kudos again to, uh, to Mark and Alan for, for doing it in New York and, and hopefully we're continuing, uh, continuing that legacy out here. So if you had any advice for a potential recruit to Guggenheim Securities in Silicon Valley uh, to, to join your banking team, what would you tell them? Yeah, I, I give this feel a lot. So, so I, you will work on the, the biggest the biggest stuff uh, that, that the largest banks work on. So you will work on the Goldman and the Catalyst uh, and the MS deal. Um, but, but we will invest more in you because you mean, you mean everything to us. We need you as much as, as, much as you'll, you, you'll need this position. Um, so we, we, you know, we do a very thorough assessment of, of all the quantitative skills, uh, qualitative skills, and we will, we will put in the training and the time to get you uh, up to speed in all the areas that you need to. Plus, because we're growing, there's this huge green field where we're, we're building out and replicating an entire bank. So it, it, to the extent you want to be a senior calling officer, there's nothing but green field out here and opportunity, and you'll be fully supported. Um, and you can trust our incentives, what we need to do, which is build out a large presence on the West Coast um, in that that opportunity is there uh, for the taking and that you have our full support because we, we need we need you to be successful. We, we can't afford you not to be successful. That's fabulous. And, and Robert, what's it like to take a practice uh, that I assume is based on relationships and move it from where you've just made managing director at, at Goldman Sachs and move it to a challenger brand like Guggenheim in Silicon Valley? It's a great question. This, th I spent so many hours, uh, I had my little Excel sheet of which relationships w I could, I thought would work well when I, when I moved them and, and which ones weren't. And all, I had all these criteria and different screens and I, I kept myself fascinated with worries for, for many hours. It was all wrong. I was completely wrong. Um, the, the, the actual thing I would go back and tell myself is whoever talks to you today at Goldman is going to talk to you tomorrow at Guggenheim. That, that surprised me, actually. I assumed there was sort of a, a, a grouping of clients that would not continue to talk to me. It's not, it's not that at all. So long as you have the bandwidth to continue to talk to them, they, they all engage. There's a little bit of a nuance around for, for us right now, a certain subset of folks that were baking off four lead left IPOs at that time. That's one group that that just, I think for, for a lot of reasons is a little different, but everyone else, the next the next wave of IPOs, the large the largest strategics in the world, everyone continued the dialogue on the other side. So that that was, um, and the folks that I wasn't talking to also, you know, weren't, weren't, gonna, weren't gonna be all excited and start talking to me because I was on the other side. So it's, it's, it's actually more intuitive in a way, but I, I tried to, I think I, I was thinking of it a little bit too, it made it a little more complicated than it needed to be. So we're in the relationship business, I think is what you just said, Robert, and, yes. and, and relationships uh, are personal. Uh, I think institutions um, can, can reinforce them or, or it can, can, can help them uh, accelerate or, or do bigger and better things together. Uh, but it's really a relationship business. Wow. It took me a long time to figure that out. Good for you. Um, Robert, I want to switch the, the focus of the topic uh, or the focus of the discussion towards um, the markets. And in 2021, uh, I am not unique to have noticed, uh, you know, the great, um, you know, trends that we saw and, and the first and, and really most incredible trend was just the enormous amount of cash that was just deployed uh, by venture, private equity, financial sponsors, and even corporations into uh, private emerging growth technology, life sciences, and clean innovation, uh, pardon me, clean in energy innovation companies. And the number was just staggering, um, $621 billion uh, last year, more than double the prior year, 311 billion in the United States, uh, also uh, more than double. But you know, one thing that we saw was was in terms of number of deals, Asia surpassed the United States with um, 36 percent, and and we'll come back to that. 959 unicorns were were uh, were minted uh, last year. 40, pardon me, 50. 51 decacorns, I may have got, sorry, 44 decacorns. I mean, it's incredible. In M&A, uh, 10,792,000 exits, 50, 58% growth. Um, SPACs, um, massive growth. And then it yeah. seemed to kind of stop. Um, and through it all, 
you know, we said that San Francisco and Silicon Valley was dying, everybody was leaving, and yet it remained the number one destination yeah. for capital at over 105 billion, more than 2x what uh, any other metropolitan area got. And when you kind of soak all of that in, that was 2021. How do you feel about 2022? Yeah, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I, I don't think it'll be 2021. I think we can all, we can all say that safely. Uh, a lot's going on. So, so, and I, I think a lot of that capital deployment was a function of, uh, you know, monetary and fiscal policy at that point, zero interest rate environment where folks are seeking yields that are going after hyper growth. So, I think that will probably be a high water mark for a little bit of time. Um, that said, the fundamentals of technology are all on the rails and, and going forward. I just think you had a valuation that had run up there, uh, really pushed up a little bit. Um, is somewhat of what we saw before with internet, uh, where, where folks sort of recognize, wow, there's this enormous opportunity of connecting consumers to the internet and valuations got ahead of where, where, um, where, where, where they could be sustained. Um, and then in this run up, it, feel, it felt like this is kind of like connecting enterprises to the internet, if you will, this, this software run up. And again, um, the difference being uh, several differences, but these are all very good, very real businesses. It's just that the valuation probably got a little bit higher um, uh, than, it, than it's sustainable. That said, it also feels a bit oversold here. Um, so I think what you're going to see is, uh, is you're going to see great businesses continue to do very well and continue to get funded. And continue to grow bigger. That the that the seeding that has been done by VCs is going to be phenomenal for the technology and for the development and in terms of the long term trends. Um, that uh, you know valuations are, are hard to predict, but definitely feels like profitability as a factor. Um, you know when you're when you know path to profitability uh, and some of those other factors, uh, efficiency around sales and marketing that we're going to see a little bit more rigor around some of that would be my prediction. Um, all all great trends. Uh, and I definitely am a huge believer uh, long term in the valley. I, I think you know the, the 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 death of the valley is 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 has been pronounced more times than any of us can count. It's a boom or bust area. This definitely doesn't feel anywhere near uh, a bust. Um, feels like at the end of last year, it just felt unsustainably busy. Um, and that now with the kind of uh, the pause in in IPOs, uh, the pause in SPACs, which we'll double click on. Um, you know, it's actually a good time for folks to just kind of finish what's on their plate. And, and markets to stabilize. Uh, and, I, and I expect we'll have a bigger, busier second half of the year than we will a first half of the year is my guess for 20. In-house Warrior, hosted by Richard Levick, chairman and CEO of Levick, an international crisis and public affairs communications company, is a daily podcast at the crossroads of law, business, and politics. It is brought to you by the Corporate Council Business Journal, an essential read for in-house counsel. Compro, providing intelligence, events, and expert opinions in corporate and integral business communications. AirAsia's RedBeat Academy, a one-stop tech leadership and innovation academy aimed at supercharging the digital economy within the Asian region. You know, a couple of themes that I wanted to touch on that you mentioned, 55% um, of the deals last year were in seed. And I think that bodes really well for uh, uh, venture in 2022 because those companies that raise seed typically raise uh, scaling capital pretty soon thereafter, um, at least if they're successful. Um, the other you know, trend was that one out of every $5 in venture went to fintech. And we've seen this explosion in decentralized uh, applications uh, on the on the internet, what were what Andreessen uh, Horowitz has coined the, the term Web3. Um, and so I, I'm pretty excited about that. But let's face it, Rob, we started the year and the markets just kind of went poof. Yeah. And we saw the IPO window slam shut. We saw the SPAC window, um, you know, get get more and more tortuous. And we've seen valuations of public companies really take a hit. Um, I think at one point we saw a 15% correction in the market. Um, and, and obviously, um, that gives a lot of pause. How do you advise CEOs in this market uh, in, in how they're looking at navigating some sort of an exit, whether it's an IPO exit that they're looking for or going public writ large or, or a, you know, a trade sale, you know, printing, it, printing, a, printing their exit pass and, and selling to either a private equity sponsor or a corporation? 
how do you ask ask them to look at the market with you in 2022, given yeah. what's happened? Great, great question. I, look, I think the North Star is always what's best for the long term interest of the business, uh, which is you know nice, nice, nice to say, but also quite true in these moments. Um, because it can be very difficult. Is there another leg down to this market? Does this go sideways for a while? Where do valuation season so that people are comfortable? Um, I think that'll all work itself out. Uh, but the, the key is kind of the North Star of the business. So I, I think on the margins, again, I, I, I don't think there's any reason to overreact at this point. But like sales and marketing efficiency, really taking a look at that, and making sure that incremental spend that you're not paying A plus dollars to a to a to a C quality uh, uh, salesperson, right? So, so you know, kind of making a little bit of discipline around those things and decisions. But otherwise, it's really all about uh, best long term investing in R and D. You know, putting put, putting putting the, um, uh, uh, the the right folks on the field, which is for, which which is challenge in this market not to overpay and to be, stay efficient with sales and marketing. But I think indexing to that um, and 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 going forward in terms of. Um, how to get bought, not sold, which is one of the one of the one of the great VC lines in the valley. I think that's all about partnerships and working with the largest strategics that make the most sense and who you think it makes most sense. Um, kind of painting a path for them by 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 finding go to market partnerships and things you can do along those ways. So there's a lot of things that can be done even in a down market to seed a great exit later on. Um, and, and again, I just think the, in, instead of optimizing or really focused on valuation, really just focus, going back to basic business of, of what makes most sense from a product and um, a sales motion perspective and really what is best for you in the long term um, and, and building a bully. I think the, 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 if there's going to be a pause, it's in these things where uh, you see someone raise money and then two quarters later, three quarters later, they're raising at you know 50% or 100% up. I think that was uh, something we'd, o- we'd only seen in the last couple of years and hadn't seen recently. Um, so just, you know, nor- normal cap- and when you're making your financial plan, normal capital deployment, you know, that you're going to raise again every, you know, 18 months or whatever it is, um, as opposed to every six or nine months. So just longer, longer windows. Let me ask you a question, uh, Rob, as we get uh, close to closing here. It, you and I and, and Louis talked a little bit about this uh, pre-show, and and that is, there seems to be almost this high school like level of the market. That is, you know, crypto becomes really popular for a while, and then we're seeing a flattening out of that right now. Um, extraordinary volatility. Spacs you mentioned already, and they're incredibly popular for about a year. What's what's that all about? That sort of lemmings approach to the markets. Yeah, no, that's a, it's it's quite a quite a quite a quite a quite a question. So so I'd say it's a little bit fact specific, but generally, if you zoom out, the way I would the way I think about it is, people have correctly often identified a major need in the market, a major opportunity in the market, um, and then. Uh, too many folks run after that same opportunity, causing the valuation to, to far exceed what can actually be sustainably achieved. And then there's a correction back. Um, Gartner has a report called the Gartner Hype Cycle, and, 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 and their imagery is this big, big um, uh, uh, kind of graph that, that shoots up very quickly, goes down, and then and then at a much slower pace kind of becomes sustainable over time. And I think that's a lot of what we see in these bubbles. So crypto, there's no question uh, that it is uh, it has a huge uh, uh, power to affect uh, governments, and nation states, um, uh, reserve currencies. The question is, is it now? Probably not to the extent that the market ran it up, right? If fintech in general huge revolution going on where for most of us, you know, I've been a Bank of America, former employee customer for a long time. Most of what I deal with the Bank of America is the app on my phone, right? I mean, what stops the next generation from not having that app and going straight, not having the physical presence going straight to the app. So there's this huge revolution people have identified. That said, you've got, you know, really large competitors over time who are also pivoting their strategy. I saw some, some, some Jamie Dimon thing, I don't know, $10 billion or something that, that JP Morgan had spent pivoting into a, a, a fintech play. Um, on the SPACs in particular, to me, I look at it again, the identification of a hole in the market. I want to say in 2000 or so, there were 200 plus or minus tech IPOs. Now we average 30 to 40 on a good year, 50 or 60. So, and meanwhile, the stats that Louis quoted, you've got the creation of all these high quality private companies that don't have a route to market if they're not the top 30 or 40. 
So you've got all these fantastic companies that, that public investors want to want to buy, want to trade in, and they need a tool for getting there. So the SPAC, the SPAC existed before. It became a very good construct to get certain people out. Some of the, you know, the, the traditional boom or bust cycle with the, with the SPACs, they, they come back during, during these times and then there's, there's challenges. But at some point, some tool to emerge uh, to, be, to fill out that demand that the public markets have for 100 plus additional public companies a year in tech, I think SPACs are a fantastic tool, definitely need some work, definitely some things uh, that can be improved there to make it more appealing for all parties involved and all stakeholders. But I, I think what, again, you're seeing the market recognizing a huge hole, you need a hundred, you need a vessel for a tool for getting a hundred companies public a year um, and, and trying to make it work with SPACs. Uh, and in this, this instance, you know, coming up with challenges, especially around capital certainty that just don't, don't work that well uh, right now, uh, but we're continuing to fix it and continue to innovate on it. And, and, and I'm hopeful in the long term, I guess. Uh, but I think that's what contributes to that, that, that incredible return. Plus more people pile in, especially if there's short term money, you know, and it keeps going up until it doesn't. So there's a bunch of people that make money. Um, uh, and, and I think that fuels it as well. Rob, my last question, which will be the last question for the show, unless Louis has got a closing question. And, uh, you know, we do the show so that uh, there is, there's only enough room for one really intelligent person on the uh, hosting. And that's, of course, Louis. So he gets to ask the, the closing question. But this is not quite fair one of the questions we get asked by C-suites a lot in this volatile market is how do we stay out of you know, the political divisiveness? And the question for you is for the first time in, in our lifetimes, we're looking at the stability of democracy and capitalism with questions in a way that we didn't any mm-hmm. other time. And I'm wondering if you're seeing any of that nervousness or concern by your clients or simply by the people that you're communicating with as they look at markets now. Yeah, interesting. I, I would say in my, my I, I maybe have the benefit of, of dealing almost exclusively with enterprise clients. So I, meaning you're selling your, your product to an enterprise. So th- those people are, as you, as you could imagine, very, very pro capital, uh, capitalism. So other than kind of people's personal views, I, I don't see a lot of that, but I don't uh, have much of the consumer facing exposure where I think you'd see that a lot more. Um, but, but generally people are very constructive and, and trying to put together deals that make sense for everyone um, and are very reasonable about it. You don't have a lot of the maybe uh, politically charged dialogues uh, that, that you could have in, in a maybe a more consumer setting. So I don't see a lot of that. Louis, closing question. Robert, um, obviously you have a lot of value to bring uh, technology CEOs and management teams as well as private equity and, and other financial sponsors. Um, and the world is big. And uh, like me, I think you probably have the problem of deciding who do I work with. Um, and so my question to you is, how is the best way to be introduced to you for a technology CEO uh, in security or infrastructure, the, your core verticals? What is the best way for them to connect with you? And, and when is the right time to, to get connected? Yeah, absolutely. So, so certainly there's network, there's other things. The easiest thing is LinkedIn. Certainly you could, you could reach out that way. The, the mo- 99% of what I get honestly is, is through uh, just a network referral, just folks uh, such as yourself, or a lot of times it's either CEOs or CFOs of companies I currently advise um, that connect me in. Uh, and I think timing wise, I, I, I you know, I, I'm, I, I've been an advisor, whether uh, accountant, lawyer, or, or banker my whole life. So I, I don't believe on, 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 uh, chintzing on fees, self-interest. And I also think that it's never too early. I, I think to have great advice and great advisors. Um, and I think in, in, on the investment banking front, uh, especially there is, you know, there's no, it, it's, uh, it's, there's no fee until, until there is. So until there's a transaction, um, all the advice is free and I think very helpful uh, and, and, and at the various stages. So there's folks, long, long-winded answer, but I spend a lot of time uh, very focused on security and infra, but all the way from folks that are pre-revenue um, all the way through the largest companies. Um, so I'm, I, I think it's, it's really important to be helpful to folks uh, because things come together quickly and, uh, and to differentiate to be uh, a major way of differentiating is to be helpful on the way. So I don't, I don't think it's ever too early and I strongly encourage people to have 
you know, uh, relationships across advisory. You know, Rob, as we're closing here, one of the things that's been really enjoyable for me, you're talking about the importance of trust and investment in your clients, potential clients. And I've only known you now for a couple of weeks and obviously only starting with a pre-show really, you know, as we say, during this COVID period in person, because Zoom counts as in person, but Louie has known you for years. And just watching the trust uh, that's so evident and obvious in the pre-show conversations, but also on the show, it's obviously genuine and an extraordinary skill that you have. So thanks so much for sharing your time with us today. It was great to have you. Thanks, Richard. And thanks, Louie. Appreciate the time. Thank you. This is Richard Levick for In-House Warrior, the daily podcast of the Corporate Council Business Journal. And as always, for Garage to Global, I've been joined by my old and dear friend, Louis Leo of Foley and Lardner, and our guest today, Rob Bartlett, Senior Managing Director of Guggenheim Securities. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow. You've been listening to the Corporate Council Business Journal's daily podcast, In-House Warrior, with host Richard Levick. If you've enjoyed listening to our show, Please rate and subscribe to the In-House Warrior on your favorite podcast platform.